I chose to teach the Beethoven Sonata in Ubiang's lesson because it is part of his audition repertoire for graduate school. And we were able to talk about uh, really specific dynamic and articulation details, which I think greatly enriched his musical interpretation, his understanding of what Beethoven's true and original intentions were as written in the score. So, so what we're hearing is really the contrast between the first two notes, which is short, and then the longer, right? Mm -hmm. Sometimes, um, you know, I've heard discussions over, oh, is it eighth note that has a staccato marking over it? Should it be different than the quarter note with a staccato marking over it? And I think it really depends on tempo, or how no. much time you have, because acoustically in Allegro Vivace, you know, two, four, in a phrase that is constructed to really be two or a four measure phrase, um, it's, it's really almost like a uh, cup time. So there's so little time to emphasize these differences. So in this particular case, I'm gonna, I'm gonna say that maybe the biggest contrast is between the first two being really short and the second two being more uh, legato and more smooth. Okay. Does that make sense? Yeah. So we have a sense of up, up, for a roll, up, up, for a roll. Does that make sense? Yes. And I've tried to make them the same sound. It's, it's a little bit loud, but that's okay. It's okay. I, I want them to be the same level of sound, not one half louder and then the second half softer or vice versa. I want them to be the same just for practice right now. Okay. okay. Sounds like that's the top here. Maybe just because it's the third time. Yeah. Right? Yeah. And then. So I, I would agree. But then make something of it. <laughs> okay. Because we need to hear, you know. more 
accurate approach to the score. Alright, and then of course the tricky part is how do we put all of these phrases together. This is typical for Beethoven to have one, two, three statements of the same thing, slightly altered. So, keep bomb, first one, and second, and third.
Ubiag's lesson on list um, inspired me to talk about how the musical interpretation is informed by the structure and form and harmonic background that supports the musical idea. Ubiang, let's talk about um, the character compare it to how it's transformed later in the piece. Okay, so can you play for me from... Well, let's just dive right into it from here. <laughs> is enough. Tell me this, which is the least interesting part of this theme. It comes from the beginning, right? That's what he immediately does with this. Um, so, so that has to be absolutely steady. Absolutely. Hear it, hear it in the background as something that is being played maybe by a different instrument or someone else who is just accompanying you who is playing the melody, but it has to be absolutely rhythmically consistent. Okay. So one more time. It really, it really gives it a sense of... Um, rhythmic energy and it propels the phrase forward if you don't get distracted by the theme in the right hand and if you just keep that left hand rhythm consistent and flowing forward. Where does the grace note come from? He introduces that right away from... Right, so that we have that specific item right at the very uh, beginning of the theme. The grace note is not melodic, it's rhythmic, right? At the beginning, it's not. Right, so there is no reason here to assume that it's any different than how he set it up at the beginning. It serves to um, emphasize the rhythmic accentuation of the downbeat. and steady the grace note in place. Let's talk about a few other things. Um, the rhythm of which is the playful part of the theme, right? And then it's not it's so that that shift between having you know the uh, the beginning of the measure and having in the middle of the measure when you switch between the two measures where it's on the beat and then two measures where it's in the middle of the measure. Okay. Okay, can we try one more time? See, I'm not really sure why it takes time to go from... Why you're setting that apart. Okay. Much better. That was the best one yet. It's really, it's really coming together. I think. Um, maybe last thing, but maybe not. Um, so we have the theme. We talked about the grace note, the left hand consistency in um, the uh, pulse, and then we talked about the next two measures, which is the uh, the turn at the beginning. And we talked about the turn being in the middle. Um, what he's doing here is he's intensifying the sound every two measures. It's really carefully constructed. So you have the beginning, which is, um, you know, a split of a second where he gives us the right same thing. Then he intensifies it by ornamenting the first beat, and then he further intensifies it by putting accents on the downbeat. So that's going to be a little bit louder. And then he writes these accented staccato marks, forte, accent on the downbeat of the last measure, rim frutzando into the frutzando. So clearly the idea is that there's a continuous crescendo 
and momentum to the end of these two, four, six, six bars that comprise the first theme. Does it make sense? Mm -hmm. uh, or the contrasting appearance of this theme, of course, is the transformation into the... So, since we started out with... Let's, let's talk with the same ideas, the consistency of rhythm, right? So, at the beginning, the first thing we talked about... recurrence of that. Here he has the same eighth note. It's very different. It's first of all it's not consistent. He has rests. And then here there's a little pitter patter. sense of rubato in the way that he pulsed the left hand eighth notes in this theme transformation as opposed to the beginning. Okay, it's not fair because I did it with two hands and I'm asking you to do it with two hands just to get the sense of flow. have to do that with the left hand. <laughs> Can you try? Yes, that's, that's the idea. That it goes forward and then it kind of fades back from the D flat. So the right hand... I want to be consistent about how, how I have approached the first theme analysis and this. Um, the next, the second thing I talked about in the first theme was the grace note. Now, the grace note was at the very beginning. But here, he put it at the very end. It's the last thing we hear. Now, remember how we talked about it being a rhythmic grace note at the beginning? This one is not rhythmic. This is an entirely melodic grace note. So instead of it being... It would very much be the opposite. Very stretched out and very expressive. Okay. So can we try... Let's see what we can do with all this. With a pulse in the left hand and then with a grace note at the end. So this part is easy. Try as hard as you can to really just think about how the left hand paces it and fit the right hand melody into the left hand, not the other way around. It will fit better if you have a sense of uh, a larger phrase with the left hand than if you try to shape the right hand to fit what the left hand might should could have been doing in the meantime. I mean, it's pretty, it's pretty easy, right? You can do it that way. I chose to teach the Bach Toccata in E minor for Desiree's lesson, who is my graduate doctoral student, uh, because it was a great example of Bach's organ virtuosic style. And the way we approached the piece in the lesson was to discuss the organ stops and the different combinations of sounds that the instrument can provide to clarify the fugal entrances in the piece. Um, you play the organ, right? Mm -hmm. You have yeah. had that experience. You're familiar with different organ stops and different sounds that they make. You know, so you have your strings, your reeds, your principal sound, and so on. So what would make this really interesting is if you could choose some of those sounds and assign them to specific occurrences of the subject throughout the piece. So, for example, you could consider the register, which would be appropriate for which register, mm -hmm. and maybe the bass um, occurrences, you know, the lowest voice occurrences of the thematic subject could be 
imagined as an organ stop that would be like a trombone or um, a bombard or you know one of the mm -hmm. louder ones and the brighter ones could be trumpet and the more intimate ones could be oboe or flute so let's try a few yeah. pieces mm -hmm. and see if that enriches one's imagination about obviously you don't have the choices that you would have with the mm -hmm. organ stops and the piano so you have to figure out some you have to figure out what components of those particular so sounds would translate well into the piano mm -hmm. sound. Mm -hmm. um, for example, the second one that comes up here. What are you thinking? What would be an appropriate sound for this? Maybe like trumpet? More I bright? think a trumpet, brighter sound, mm -hmm. this is an upper register. Okay. And uh, in order for it to be distinguished, mm -hmm. Uh, with all the other things that are going on, I think a trumpet would, would bring a bring good character out. Yes. Okay, so we have to figure out how can we make a trumpet-like sound in the on a piano, yeah. right? Mm -hmm. So some of the some of the descriptions of the trumpet sound mm -hmm. are what? It's bright, it's edgy, it's, it projects well, mm -hmm. it's uh, shiny, it's right? shiny. Yes. It's usually very strongly articulated. So when you get to the to that statement, which is the second statement of the theme, let's see if the fingers can yeah. um, translate those aspects into the sound. So shiny, mm -hmm. bright, edgy, articulated, um, as opposed to the second one, or the third one, excuse me, which is the next one, which happens in the left and in the lower register, uh, maybe more blended in a way, less yes. articulated than the so I think the trombone is not as clear. Yeah, as it's, a, it's a more, it's a rich timbre that maybe blends notes in a little bit more smooth way than trumpet, mm -hmm. which is really uh, particular and punctual with the, with the articulations, the armature. Yes. Mm -hmm. So how would you use your left hand differently from your right hand in the trumpet-like sound? You know, so you probably need more articulation, more staccato mm -hmm. articulation, and really focus on emphasizing the brightness in the upper notes mm -hmm. um, in the trumpet statement as opposed to the trombone one where you would want to use maybe a more arm weight mm -hmm. and a heavier, uh, more pressure touch and more mm -hmm. legato. Can we yes. try those two? Yes. Let's try. Let's just do this one. Okay. Okay, not bad, but what I would, what I would want a little bit more of the, your fourth and fifth finger, it doesn't quite speak. Mm -hmm. something lower, like very, very heavy and very loud, mm -hmm. how would a finger motion translate into something that is supposed to sound, you know, some, some of the descriptions of that sound would be like darker, more sonorous. I would suggest you use a little bit, redistribute the weight in your hand a little bit more, a mm -hmm. little bit more weight in the middle of your palm okay. for a thicker sound. <laughs> distributing the weight right now it's pretty similar to how you did the right hands you're getting this really really hold the weight 
right here. The okay. right here. Oh, yeah. okay. Give me thirty percent more. Okay. <laughs> okay. So resonant yeah. and so so yeah, exciting. you're most boring this part. Uh huh. Mm -hmm. Yeah, exactly. Okay, so I want to hear what it sounds like with the other hand. <laughs> okay. Ian's lesson, which included Chopin scherzo in B flat minor, was an example of what I find is necessary to approach in lessons with high school students who may not yet be at a professional study level. So what we talked about during his lesson were things that addressed control of the piano and understanding of the texture, how to voice different um, registers of the piano to maximize the clarity of the musical phrase and to obtain the most beautiful sound possible as intended by Chopin. That was a really nice performance in the first section and very passionate and very musical and uh, very engaging. Okay, um, let's talk about playing loudly. So the first page obviously uh, presents us with this very dramatic contrast between the and then the loud fortissimo. No matter how loud the chords are, one has to voice them. So you can play only as loudly as you are able to project the melodic content of the chords on top of the actual sound you're making. Does that make sense? So can we try the beginning one more time and see if we can really focus on not losing the melody in the fortissimo? Other than that, I thought it was very good. as well. So the top hand, the right hand, should be the one that leads. So when you're approaching this figure every time, the right hand has to be a little bit brighter. Okay? Every single time. Can we try it? Mm -hmm. It's good. I didn't hear the connection to here and back. I kind of went here and back. You disconnect it. So think about the dip down and back up. rotate really quickly from five to three plus you have a white and black key it's a it's a that's better do you hear that it's it's more concise the sound is more concise okay together good very nice yeah, perfect some of the time um i thought that the melody got a little bit covered up and lost, 
with all the um, eighth note activity that is going on in the accompaniment in this section. So let's see if we can um, separate the textures a little bit in this section and make the right hand sing and the left hand fulfill its role of giving it impetus and um, harmony, harmonic support, and but not cover up the melody, okay? So how about if we do a little exercise of separating the three textures? First of all, I should clarify what I mean by three textures, uh, three layers of a texture. The first one would be the melody which really has more than one part, right? Because there's the top and the bottom, which is not nearly as interesting as the top, but still there and needs to be balanced with the top. Then in the left end, you have this arpeggiated figure, um, which I can be maybe separated into the bass note and then the favor and see if you can play the left hand starting there just like I did just use the left hand for the bass note and the right hand for the for the arpeggiated chord and make sure that the arpeggiated part of the chord is softer than the bass note so we want to hear two different parts within the left hand relationship with the top and this forms a different relationship so can, can you practice that for me can you do the first one which is just the bass after you have those three uh, layers really precisely um, formed and practiced and measured in terms of volume and expression, it should all come together very beautifully, as intended. Does your music say sotto voce yes. at the beginning? What does that mean? Under Okay. Um, yes, it does. One other thing that I'm wondering about is how are you thinking about tempo in this? Is this the same tempo as... What that translates to in piano playing is using the soft pedal. It's like the marking harmonioso, which almost always, I've never seen an example where it doesn't mean to use pedal. Um, so sotto voce is kind of a, a way of writing in the suggestion to use una corda. Thing. 
thing that I'm wondering about is how are you thinking about tempo in this? Is this the same tempo? No, I'm One, two, three, four. How much slower? <laughs> There has to be a balance between rubato and tempo. Rubato has to happen within a tempo, but if the tempo is not clear, then rubato doesn't really apply. It just, it just serves to create instability. So we must feel the tempo first before you start. So my suggestion would be not to do a whole lot of rubato the very first time you play this. It comes back over and over again, but try to set it up so that it doesn't waver so much in time, okay? saying you should be exactly no a little freer a little softer and a little I mean a little um, slower but not quite like it's really quite a bit different from the opening tempo so move these stretched out and relaxed and dreamy without actually making it really slow. Okay, can we try one more time? very very delicately uh, well, make them look short does it mean that you touch the tempo. piano delicately or how do you get an impression of delicately of this well, this particular Delicate, the word delicate implies fragility, something that can be broken, right? Otherwise, it isn't delicate. If it's not perishable or, or fragile, it's not really delicate. So, can you make it sound like just the most delicate crystal pings, bells? That comes after. So something totally different than the uh, melody beforehand. Can we try from here? I'd like to hear the introversion of the first phrase, still expressive, and then the more extroverted nature of the second phrase, which has almost a little bit of a dance rhythm to it with the left hand. It would be nice to hear that buoyancy that is suddenly present and then contrasted by the delicate uh, fioratura at the end. Okay? Let's put these three together the sottovoce at the beginning, then the piano, and then the delicate, fragile sound. Mm -hmm. 